Good afternoon, welcome to the uh, October 18th edition of the Transportation and Infrastructure Committee. I do detect a quorum. Uh, so what, how we'll run the meeting today is we'll go through consent agenda on resolutions. We have a small consent agenda on second reading bills and let's get through those. Um, and then the director of NDOT has got a presentation on smart parking program. Uh, we'll have uh, the debate on the bill after that. And then there'll be another short presentation by NDOT uh, at the conclusion of the debate on that bill. So without any further ado, here are the bills on consent for resolutions. RS 2022, 1816, 1817, 1818, and 1819. Does anyone want to pull any of those now? Seeing none, I'll go ahead and read the captions. RS 2022 1816, wrote and other sponsors approves a proposal between the Tennessee Department of Transportation and the Nashville Department of Transportation for the acceptance of a construction easement and the maintenance of traffic control devices in connection with construction of a bridge replacement on Star Route 1 over 11th Avenue South and CSX Railroad. Uh, RS 2022 1817, wrote and other sponsors approves the Safer Streets Nashville, pedestrian and bicycle bicycle safety awareness grant from the Tennessee Highway Safety Office to the Metro Nashville Department of Transportation and multimodal infrastructure to educate the public on pedestrian and bicycle safety awareness. RS 2022 1818 wrote and other sponsors uh, approves uh, an application for a bridge investment program grant from the Tennessee Department of Transportation to the Metro Nashville Department of Transportation and multimodal infrastructure to replace two bridges over CSX active rail lines within their right of way in the Madison and East Nashville neighborhoods. RS 2022-1819 wrote and other sponsors approves an application for a safe streets for all grant from the U.S. Department of Transportation to the Metro Nashville Department of Transportation and multimodal infrastructure to construct safety improvements for those walking, biking, or using transit along Nolansville Pike between McCall Street and Haywood Lane. Uh, that's a conclusion of uh, the captions. Does anybody want to pull anything from the consent agenda? All right, seeing none, all in favor of the consent agenda, say aye. Any opposed? The consent agenda is recommended for approval. I have two bills on second reading, which will be on the second reading consent agenda. They are BL 2022-1477 and BL 2022-1478. Any of those need to be taken off consent? Seeing none, I'll read the captions. BL 2022-1477, Evans and other sponsors, authorizes Metro government to accept a public fire hydrant assembly for property located at 3887 Central Pike. BL 2022-1478, authorizes Metro government to accept a public fire hydrant assembly for property located at 245B Hermitage Avenue. Any need to come off? Seeing none, all in favor of the consent agenda on second reading, say aye. aye. Any opposed? The consent agenda passes on second reading. Before we hear the presentations, Councilman O'Connell, I want to go to you on BL 2022-1410, uh, men's chapters 6.04 and 13.08 of the Metro Code to authorize the installation of interactive wayfinding kiosks within the public right-of-way and authorizes the Metro Planning Department and the Metro Purchasing Agent to issue a request for proposals for wayfinding kiosks. Councilman O'Connell. Oh, one of these days I'm gonna get better at that. My apologies. No problem. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, I know we, you know, we had humble beginnings in a room down the hall, and it's, <laughs> you know, being on this big stage. I still like that humility. So. <laughs> uh, no, appreciate the recognition um, on this. Bill, I'm gonna um, request that colleagues uh, defer indefinitely, and I'd move to do so with a brief comment. Okay, uh, do we, I think we need to move the bill to, in order to move the bill, moved and seconded, and Councilman O'Connell has moved to defer indefinitely, and that's properly seconded. Councilman O'Connell, back to you. Thank you. Um, we have had, uh, since this bill was filed, I know I've had um, an initial conversation 
with NDOT as well as with some other um, key stakeholders in this as we imagine the kiosks would be um, at least initially, the the wayfinding initiative would probably have its footprint largest in District 19. I had uh, worked with both the Convention Visitors Corporation and Nashville Downtown Partnership um, to you know see where we were a few years after this conversation began. I think there's a lot of interest in a more modern and better maintained approach to wayfinding, but I think um, to NDOT's point, I'm sure the uh, director can confirm this, there's a, a strong and appropriate interest in assuring that this conversation um, is aligned with and dovetails with the um, Downtown Connect program, and I would, I would defer to NDOT staff to uh, validate that. Director Alcon. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, thank you very much for that, Councilmember O'Connell. Uh, we have asked if we could please wait for the completion of Connect Downtown to understand exactly uh, the, uh, because we're anticipating a list of recommendations, including wayfinding being part of it. And then this would be something that we could actually pull in together with those recommendations. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you. There's a motion on the floor for indefinite deferral. Any discussion on the indefinite deferral? Seeing none, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Recommended that uh, this bill be indefinitely deferred. Thank you, Councilman O'Connell. Uh, I will now go to Director Alicarn, who will give us a presentation on the smart parking program contract. Director Alicon, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So this is a bill that's before y'all for second reading tonight. We wanted to do a quick overview with the Transportation Infrastructure Committee on the Smart Parking Program. So I um, always assume everybody knows, but just to be on the safe side, really the Smart Parking Program is looking for us to um, update our current infrastructure system that we have on the curbside, um, removing the use now. Right now we handwrite all of our tickets, we process everything, manually, so it's looking at us actually moving to a more digital age of infrastructure. It's also gonna be looking at upgrading our current um, meters. We have um, single space meters out there that take coins. This is gonna allow us to actually improve the overall payment technologies where we can have available for the folks that are visiting and for our residents as well and business owners, the option for credit card payment as well as the ability to pay by text, by a QR code or through an application and yes, we still would be taking cash, but we wanted to make as many options available in today's technology. And a lot of our private sector is actually already doing this. So this will be something that will be quite normal to everyone. And most of all, we feel like moving into a smart parking system is gonna allow for better compliance so that we can look at a better revenue stream. So, Enforcement's gonna be a real key part of this. One of the things I just wanna really highlight is part of this um, contract, we will be increasing the staff from five, which we currently have, to 13. We will be adding, LAS will be providing eight enforcement folks that will be going out and actually enforcing the right of way um, everywhere um, it's appropriate, as well, including in the residential parking program areas. Uh, we will be moving to electronic ticketing, as I had mentioned, um, so no need for paper. They'll be able to just come through digitally scan it, write the ticket if there's not uh, proper um, compliance, and then they'll move on. So we're gonna looking for a lot of efficiencies there. Uh, Every, we will have a staff member that will be reviewing every single ticket before we send it over because of the, the uh, clerk's off, the county court actually, not the county, excuse me, the court actually will be collecting the citation revenue. Uh, so we have to review all of them. Uh, there is a state statute that requires that it be reviewed by a municipal individual prior to it being submitted to the court for its, ver for its um, validity of the ticket. So we'll be reviewing all of them and then sending it over to the court for collection. And we're working with the court now on what on that movement back and forth between our two departments. And then also we just feel like with this new technology, it's just gonna make us a lot more efficient in our for enforcement, especially with folks that are non-compliance with the parking laws. So a little bit about the terms of the contract. It is a five-year contract. 
Metro Nashville will be maintaining ownership and management of all of the public right away. And I think that's really significantly different from the prior one. We continue to manage and own, and that also goes with the equipment. All the equipment we will be purchasing will be owned by Metro Nashville. We can also terminate this contract with 30 day notice. Um, all the capital investment that is made uh, through t last parking will be, uh, re they will get reimbursed, so it'll be our equipment, we will own it. There is no proprietary to this, so we, if after five years we decide to move in-house, we still have all of that. We own all the technology, we we'll own all the data, so that's really important. This contract also requires $2 million annually in income. So if we, for some reason, do not collect enough revenue to cover the expenses, no matter what, they're gonna give us $2 million that will cover expenses. So that's a really key thing. And then the one last thing that's also really different in this one is all the funds collected, whether it's cash, credit card, are going to be deposited directly into Metro account. Laz is not getting any of our dollars. Every bit of it is going into our account and then we're gonna be reimbursing them on a monthly basis for expenses for helping us with the, prog with the parking program. So the last thing real quick is I just kind of want to highlight some of the revenue expectations that we have. So in year one, we are anticipating, because we were, when this was done, please understand, I was kind of hoping that we would have been before y'all a few months back and we would have already been, have ordered the equipment, be ready to kick this off at the beginning of the new year. We're being pushed back roughly about three months, but we anticipate in year one that we would do approximately $2.8 million worth of revenue. Um, and that's going to be through different initiatives compliance being one. Another one will actually be um, looking at um, oper changing to the operation hours. Right now we turn off at five and not, not on the weekend. So we wanna actually look at changing the operation hours. It's also gonna take into consideration there's a lot of opportunities for inventory to be added. So all of that's gonna be built into it. Year two, we're anticipating between three to five million. Year uh, three would be between five and seven. Year four is between seven and 10. And year five is gonna be 10 to 15 and this is we have to take everything that we do in the right of way back to traffic and parking commission for approval so these are based on anticipating of doing um, hours of enforcement um, actually extending adding more meter inventory to our uh, to our system than what we have today which is we're just under 2,000 uh, meter spaces and looking at expanding that it's also maybe the potential of looking at some revenue increase and just overall the efficiency improvements in the system altogether. So with that, I was really quick and short, but I'll take any questions. Thank you. Uh, let's get, we've got a bill that relates to this. So let's get the bill on the floor and we, and Director Alicorn will take all the questions you have about this. So bill is BL 2022-1475, Henderson and other sponsors, approves an agreement between Metro Government and LAS Parking LLC relating to the operation and management of the on-street metered parking program within the public rights of way of the metropolitan area and approves a lease agreement to lease Metro's property to LAS Parking Georgia LLC to use as office space in performing these functions. Uh, do I have a motion? Uh, so moved and properly seconded. Council Member Henderson, uh, this is your bill, so you have the floor. Uh, thank you, Chair Pulley. I also have a housekeeping amendment, and so um, for purposes of discussion, I didn't know if it might be prudent just to go ahead and advance uh, the amendment, or we can wait till after the discussion at your go, discretion. You can feel free to go ahead and move your amendment. Okay, uh, colleagues, amendment that is before you uh, incorporates uh, some language uh, that was part of the uh, approval motion at Traffic and Parking Commission. Um, it was brought to our attention by the circuit court clerk, just a little clarification wanted uh, about uh, the definition of citation. Uh, and as well at the time, the uh, lease agreement for the space within a Metro uh, Public Works facility uh, where the uh, parking uh, contractor uh, will house their operations uh, had not been uh, fully effectuated at that time or completed. So schedule 14 is updated with that uh, document. And so the amendment addresses those two things, the definition of citation and uh, the finalized lease agreement. Do you have a motion for the amendment? I would move the amendment, please. Moved and properly seconded. Any discussion on the amendment? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? 
All right, seeing none, we are now on the bill as amended. And Council Lady Allen, I believe uh, yours was the first hand I saw up for questions relating to the bill. And that's all part of it, so <laughs> go right ahead. Oh, um, I kind of like having all this control over voices. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions, if, it, if it's okay. First, I mean, my first overarching question, but first let me say, I have followed the very nice meter readers around with the legal pad and the, and the, and the memo tickets, and I am so glad we are coming into the 21st century, so thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, but I do, wanna, I do wanna understand what our goal is here. Um, I mean, I know in some places the reason we have parking meters is to move the cars so that there is parking available for customers, because ultimately, I think our goal is to ensure that our businesses can thrive because their customers can get to them. So um, I, I just wanna make sure, as we talk about extending hours and adding more meters, is that, is, is that it feels driven by additional revenue, which is also a good thing, but is that um, in harmony with the goal of helping our businesses thrive and ensuring that there are places to park and that people will actually come park there or they won't just say, oh, forget it, I'm not going downtown because I have to pay for parking now, even on Sundays. So are we keeping those two yes, goals in, in intention? Yes, ma'am, very much so. Okay. So we are actually, just as an FYI, we're working with Downtown Partnership because we do recognize right now a lot of the, the on-street meter spaces are actually uh, being utilized by employees in the downtown. So we're working with Downtown Partnership right now with setting up an employee parking program um, and then how we would move them about late at night because we know a lot of our employees do not get off work until after two or three in the morning. So how do we make sure that we're supporting them because a lot of them folks get off of business, out of work, and they got a lot of cash on them. So we wanna make sure they can move safely so we are looking at what that shuttle service needs to look like. So yes, it is about continuing to support our businesses and also making sure we can support the employees for the downtown area as well. They're just not gonna have the upfront parking because we do want that for our, the folks coming down and that they have the turns in the spaces to the businesses will thrive more. Great, and so will, will those decisions about increasing hours and, and meters, will they be driven by any kind of data that shows oh, there's a problem here, the parking's not turning over enough, or actually the parking's working great here, we don't need meters, how will that decision be made? Y yes, ma'am, it's gonna be driven by all of that, and we have to take all of that before traffic and parking before we can do anything. Okay, so, I, tr I trust um, traffic and parking. I can assure you they're gonna make sure that I dot my I's and cross my T's. Great, and then can you, um, can you verify, when, I mean, we're owning the equipment, which I think is great, that means we're buying all the new equipment, so yes, when Laz comes in and and facilitates that the bill comes to us. Is that right? So the equipment uh, is actually part of this contract. So it's all included in this. So Flowbird is actually gonna be the multi-space meters that we're looking to purchase. And that's gonna actually, that's included as part of one of their subcontractors in this. Gotcha. So uh, we do have a parking fund. So dollars that have been collected over the years from the meters actually get earmarked for future parking and infrastructure improvements. So there's another outcome of why uh -huh. we wanna push okay. the revenue is it allows us to look at improving the infrastructure as well as the parking program. Um, so we have those dollars to be able to make those purchases. So they're already sitting there somewhere yes, waiting. Okay, that's great. And then I think this is my final question. Will this be smart enough that we could maybe eventually hook up with one of those geo locator things that says five parking meters on the street next door, anything like that. Is that possible in the future? Yes, ma'am. I am hoping that we would actually even allow people to reserve parking. So if someone's coming down for a predator game and they know parking's available at this spot, they would actually be able to reserve and have that space held for them. Wow. And so there's a lot of great technology out there. So, but baby steps till we get there. Great, okay, I think that's a good goal. Thank you so much. You're very welcome, thank, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Rowland. Councilman Cash, I saw your hand up. Up, uh, and I saw Councilman Bradford, uh, go, the floor is yours. And anybody else who wants to get in the queue, just raise your hand. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, uh, there, there are a lot of things uh, about this plan that I'm excited about. I think it's, uh, you know, moving us into the 21st century, and uh, you're, you know, it's opening up some poss some possibilities for better enforcement. And that's kind of, as you are not, I bet, not surprised. That's what I want to ask about. So. Um, I mean, my understanding is it's going to free up uh, personnel to uh, better enforce uh, violations or better to ding violations in residential 
permit parking areas, bike lanes, uh, two hour parking, I would assume like if there's somebody that's parked past the, don't pa park past the sign and their tail end is in the intersection or on the crosswalk, that all that is, is a part of this. And I guess I'm just wanting to A, like reinforce, that's, that's the big thing for me. And to, to what degree is, the, is that part of it legislated or written policy versus kind of <laughs> you assuring us that that's what's going to happen? You, know, so, you might you might get <laughs> Pete Buttigieg's job someday and soon. And wow, I want to make sure I want to make sure that we're setting good policy for the long term. So in the first 30 days, we actually will be putting together the business plan that will outline all of that and the policies as well that will support that. But as you know, there's actually already a program and policy in place when it comes to like the residential parking as well as their standard laws about night parking um, and bike lanes, unloading zones, all of that. That's kind of already on the book. So our job is to enforce it. We have not always done the best job in the past. So what's going to be great about this contract is is LADS will be providing us with eight folks that we will get trained and certified that will help us with that enforcement so that we're actually covering more of the area than we ever have in the past. And it's part of that plan to have like a regular system or a regular pattern of where they travel. So like I don't expect us to get every car that needs to be ticketed, but we, I know in my in parts of my district we need a pattern so that they learn there, some of my, some of the folks parking in my district are taking a risk, and they're winning they're gambling. at that risk right now yeah, in terms gambling. of how much it's going to cost them to park, right? <laughs> uh, and uh, so I think you just having a regular pattern, having a map for sure of where all the different parking. Um, Most definitely. Modes are the, in terms of residential permit and two hour and. Yes. Um, and one other question, uh, I think one other. Uh, you, you talked about touchless, ma mailing them the tickets, I assume. Um, so the court system will be ha handling that. So for example, if we catch someone who is illegally parked and they see us writing their ticket, they try to drive off thinking they can't get the ticket, but they may have already caught all the information. So yes, sir, the ticket will actually be pulled up. We have, we will be gathering register owner information based on that license tag, which is a standard practice in the parking industry. Um, that will go to the court system and they will actually send them notification that a ticket has been received. And we're gonna collaborate with the court on that to make sure that we're giving the, we're informing the community as much as possible if a citation has been received. So I guess my, my question about that, I mean, I, I get that in terms of efficiency and, and time saver and, and being able to cover a lot of area quickly. Um, but at the same time, also, I think hopefully one of our goals, at least initially, is to train people to do the right thing and park in the right place and, you know, drive safely. <laughs> and uh, and yes, so I sir. guess I guess, you know, getting something days later kind of isn't the same it's a consequence, but it's not the same, like, you need to get your car out of the bike lane now, <laughs> not three days later, oops, right. I guess I shouldn't have done that. So I guess that's a little a little bit of a concern of mine. So before we go head on in, into the new digital world of this program, we are going to do what I consider a soft launch, which is where you're doing more of an educational um, piece. So they'll receive a warning versus a citation so that they'll know, hey, you can no longer park in a bike lane. And we're not going to do it for one day or two days. It'll be for a few weeks, if not a month, so that we can educate the public because you're, we haven't been enforcing. They've kind of been used to rolling the dice and gambling and winning. And all of a sudden now we give them a ticket that's a high price and they're going to go, oh my gosh, what happened? So we do want to take have a chance and actually inf educate. So we are working with the courts on an educational component as well as we'll do an education and also we will use the enforcement as an education in the field for a soft launch before we actually dive head in um, and really start enforcing. And, um, to so that's going to be like a personal either leave something on their car or say Correct. something to them if you see them there. Correct. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. Thank yes, you. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Cash. Uh, Councilmember Bradford with Councilmember Young on deck. Thank you. Um, two questions. The first one, I just wanted to get some clarification, and it's in line with one that Councilmember Allen asked. Um, when you were listing out the expected revenue for the, the each individual year, 
Is that going into the same pot as the previous monies and will be earmarked for parking infrastructure or is that going into the general fund for any use? It, it will be earmarked and going into the parking fund. Um, okay. The charter is very clear about that. Okay, the other question, I don't have the analysis in front of me. So the lease for LAS, um, what's, what are the terms for that? How much are they paying for that lease? And then uh, again, a clarification about the equipment. You stated the equipment is covered in the cost of this contract. At the end of the contract, do we, does Metro end up owning all that equipment? And so that it, if we can, if we go with another contractor after the end, we don't have to worry about getting new equipment and so on and so forth. So let me address the lease first. So the lease is a $1 uh, a year lease that LAS will be signing with us and it's to be able to use office space on our, on, um, um, in DOT's property versus them going out and getting an office space in the in the market. So it's gonna actually save us a lot of money. But by uh, practices and by uh, requirement, they have to sign a lease with us. So it's actually lease for use of office space for them to um, have operations. And we're really super excited that they're gonna be there with us on property so that there's an appropriate engagement. So that's the lease that's before you. It can be, it can be terminated under the same conditions as the current contract, which we can we can terminate this contract with 30 day notice. So the two run hand in hand together. And Teresa, if I say something wrong, jump in. Uh, the second question is, uh, they the, the equipment is going to be purchased by LAS, but then they're gonna be sending it to us for reimbursement. We will be reimbursing them. So we will own the equipment. Outright. So at the end of five years, if we decide not to extend this uh, this contract and we're gonna move forward with another contract or bringing it in house, it's all our equipment, we own it. So we've been very careful. We've worked with the court on the citation side of it to make sure it meets their needs. And we've also really have gone through a hard research to make sure that the equipment that they're recommending meets what we feel is the need of our community. Okay, and just one follow up on that. So, I've always had kind of issues with some of these $1 leases um, when we're in situations where we're talking about, hey, we need more money, we're having revenue issues, we're having budget issues, but here's a $1 a month lease. Do you have on hand or do you know off the top of your head what the difference in the cost would have been had they gone with an outside lease at market rate compared to coming to us for $1? So in their, in their proposal that they provided us, they had actually put in um, $10,000 for uh, office space rental that we would have had to reimburse them for through the contract and now it's a dollar a year. So it's actually gonna be about a hundred plus thousand dollars savings to the contract in, in Metro's favor by them actually being on our property. Okay, thank you. You're welcome, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Radford. Uh, Councilmember Young, the floor is yours with Councilmember O'Connell and Gamble to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, and to the to add to the the point of the office location, Councilman Bradford, uh, I guess you you could say that that they would be right under the nose, the director, because I think from looking at that map that that building is located right outside your window. It is. So uh, her view will be. Uh, their office and the interstate exit ramp. <laughs> so uh, I guess that wasn't part of the benefits package when we attracted you to come here, huh? Was the view <laughs> from the office. Um, going back to, to some of the points that uh, Councilmember Allen was, was making maybe about, is this more revenue driven or what? And, and I'll go ahead and say, Director, I think I have more opining to do than questioning. Um, I would say that moving to these smart meters is actually gonna increase the accessibility of parking. As someone who probably doesn't have any cash in my pocket right now, I don't have it. And so it is not uncommon for me to see a parking spot with a meter that I can't park in because I don't have any coins. Or I might even have cash, but I don't have coins. So then I'll get to have to, you know, go pay a private lot to park there. So I think we are actually increasing the accessibility of parking by going to these digital meters. Um, I, I think as we increase the footprint of where paid parking is and that we're actually enforcing it, this is um, also pushing people to think more about other modes of transit besides a car with one person in it. Um, 
When it comes to the enforcement, a question I do have is, I know that in probably about half the private lots that I park in, now you don't even interact with a, a yeah. mechanism. <laughs> yeah, you, just, yeah. you, you have your account with that parking company and it reads your license plate when you go in and it reads it when you go out. And when you go out, you get a text message that said, thanks for parking at the such and such or Pine Street garage. And you get dinged for however long you were there. I know in a garage setting where there's one entrance and exit, the, using the, the cameras is a easy way to do it. Are there methods where that makes sense in some of the on-street situations? I mean, or um, so that there is more enforcement of the parking versus us at this point still relying on a human being walking around? <laughs> So, uh, yes, sir, that is a direction we could. So I had a chance to talk about reservation parking. That would require putting a camera up, holding the spot, and that would be a way of also doing enforcement. Okay. So it is something that we're looking at down the road, but we just need to get out the gate first. Right, yeah. And so um, I guess, too, will we then, from an enforcement standpoint, be able to know and I guess this would go along with a camera for the camera to know that, hey, there's a car in this spot and it's the time is, has elapsed. Yes, and so sir. we need to send someone to, yeah. Yes, sir. Um, this is a light years ahead of our time, maybe suggestion or seed to plant. But as the usage of electric vehicles continue to increase, I don't know if this is done anywhere else, yes. but the dual purpose of having a meter everywhere, if it's also connected to the grid for charging, one, another revenue stream uh, for, for Metro, making use of existing right away, and two, um, increasing the, the availability for folks who need access to charging infrastructure. So one of the reasons that we actually were, um, were attracted to Flowbird um, equipment is they do have an EV charger that you can connect to it. Lovely, okay, so, I wasn't even sure if that was a thing. It, 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 yes sir, it sure is. So um, it is something we are also considering. So I'm working yes. with Kendra. Oh, I know that's not yeah, an instant thing. I'm working thing. with Kendra on sustainable practice. So yes sir, we're looking at that as well. Okay, well, that, uh, um, that rocks. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Mr. You. Chair. Thank you, Councilman Young. Uh, Councilman O'Connell, the floor is yours. Councilman Gamble's on deck. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, I think following up from uh, Councilmember Young's line of inquiry, um, do we have an estimate on the total cost of equipment that would be a part of this? Um, I will 30 days after. I mean, we have a rough idea right now, but uh, part of the business plan is, and we've started actually GISing all of the roads and where we have meters that we would remove and how many new ones we need. So each one of the, the equipment, the, excuse me, the, um, multi-space unit is roughly around um, 8,500, and then you're looking at about 1,500 to install, so it's about a $10,000 cost. You're looking at one per street or per block. Typically, it usually covers about 12 to 14 spaces. So we've started that inventory out now to look at what it is. We're expecting to spend roughly around $250,000 on overall equipment for startup capital. Okay, and that, I guess that leads me to my next question, which is, uh, you know, when I when I joined the Traffic and Parking Commission early in the term, one of the goals I had was actually to uh, learn as many lessons from the previous privatization push uh, and do as much of that publicly as we could. Um, the, to Councilmember Young's point, the landscape has continued to change. I know there are some cities that are moving away from metered equipment altogether and in fact moving toward a contactless payment system. Mm -hmm. So part of me is wondering, is, you know, is it worth even investing in all that equipment or going ahead and just, instead of a, a whole long proposal like this with a bunch of new equipment that has installation costs and maintenance costs, uh, 
uh, just moving to a contactless payment system altogether. So we are setting up for a hybrid approach to that. So our, we're, we feel that it's not in the best interest just to pull away completely to a contactless with the number of visitors that we have to our area. Um, but the opportunity is, for example, if we come into an area and we feel like we can actually expand it out further because we are coming in offering QR codes, text messaging, as well as the ability to pay for through an app. So we're, we're, we're using all of those payment options, which is that contactless business. Um, but we do want to also make the option available to either go and pay the meter if someone doesn't have a phone, um, and they can still do that with credit card or cat, cr cash. But as we build up the system, we understand what the demand is basically in cash versus credit card, using QR, using text, using the app. We can then um, take that equipment and relocate it so that maybe perhaps instead of it being every 12 to 14 spaces, we're now doing every 20 to 24 spaces, and that will allow us to expand the inventory out. So we have this initial investment, but before we make any additional investment, we will look at how we can further expand the business versus just going out and buying new equipment. So we are being very cognizant of that as we're kicking into the first capital um, purchase. Can you help me understand how the visitor flow affects the decision about contactless? Well, not everybody has a cell phone, so uh, you have to make, you have to ha somewhere put in some availability for payment. And right now, we really do not have good data to tell us whether people will pay by credit card or pay f by cash um, because we, every coins. And we do know right now a lot of people just do not pay. So um, we're going to use some of that initial um, investment to figure out what exactly is happening in the field. And then we'll be able to come back with a better evaluation about whether we need to purchase any more additional equipment or we continue to take the equipment, like I said, so every instead of every 10, every 12 to 14 spaces, we're looking at now doing 20 to 24 spaces that allows us to move that equipment somewhere else and continue to expand out the um, inventory of the of the program. Okay. I just, you know, I, I know how far behind we are yes. on getting to this point, and I don't want to be in a place where we buy equipment today. We set ourselves up for the same trap. Ten years from now, that equipment is hopelessly out of date with whatever technologies are available. And, you know, we have, uh, uh, you know, things that people are laughing at on the street, which is where we are right now. Um, and so if we have an opportunity to step away from equipment for piloting, I mean, I, I, you know, it, it seems to me like uh, it, it doesn't sound like an extraordinarily high cost to get there, but it, I'm glad to hear that it sounds like we may have an opportunity to flex that out rather than just be you know, Correct. putting putting something where we all are. If, I, if I could just yeah. share on that for a Please. minute, sir. The average lifespan of the equipment right now is typically seven years. And, and that's been pretty much the life cycle of equipment, for, I want to say, for the past two decades because the technology has moved so quickly in the parking industry as it has in the rest of the world. So we get iPhones. Except here in Nashville. It, well, we just, we just are not good with change, I guess I would put it that way. <laughs> we like our tradition. There's a pun in there too, so. <laughs> so, <laughs> so um, I didn't mean that in any bad way. So if, I, if it came across that way, I apologize ahead of time. But um, I am very aware of that. So as some of this equipment does age out and technology moves in, we'll definitely move into that direction. So for example, we talked about parking reservations. We talked about uh, cameras being used. That doesn't require any equipment. Everything, you come in, your tax caught, you get a tax, you're told to register, you're not doing anything. So I do envision us moving in that direction. That is a little bit not a little bit, that's costly. And so I need to build the program and understand what the demand is, understand how much is gonna be purchased in credit cards. So I'm making sure that we're spending the dollars wisely. And we just really do not have a good foundation to go off of right now. I just have coins that are collected from a meter. I don't even know which meter it comes from. I don't know what area it comes from. I really do not have good data to give me comfort to say and sit here and say, this is what we should do and just go completely contactless because I really do not understand what the demand is with the current program that we've had in place. And I guess I appreciate that. I think the other thing I would ask is, I know this has been considered by the Traffic and Parking Commission, but when we had 
a previous stab at this where I saw the greatest consternation was among neighborhoods. Has NDOT done any community outreach about this? Have you all reached out to neighborhood organizations to brief them on this? We um, have not. We plan on moving through this slow. So we do have some residential parking um, programs that are in place. We will be reaching out to those neighborhoods. Again, I said we're gonna start with a soft launch and we're gonna do use that as an educational piece as well as we're gonna be reaching out through the council members that we're gonna start this enforcement program. I have a 12 week lead time for the equipment to be purchased, so part of the business plan is going to include that community outreach, that expectation, and pretty much when we think that hard date would be that we would actually be doing enforcement and, and expecting compliance. And so am I right that the residential permit parking program would be rolled into this agreement? Yes, sir. And uh, part of the enforcement. Then connecting what you just said with going back to the beginning. Um, it sounded like that inventory and that business plan. How far out is that business plan? They have to have it uh, within 30 days once the contract is signed. Okay, so we have a little bit of a chicken and egg issue here where we have to approve the agreement before we get the business plan. Yeah, but if there's any major changes like to operational hours, fee structures, inventory, any of that, even a parking program, a residential parking program that's currently in place, any changes to that, I have to take it to traffic and parking before I can do anything. But at this point, there has been no in-dot contact with residential areas that are participants in the permit program? No, sir. All right, thank you. Thank you, Councilman Marcano. Council Member Gandel. Thank yeah. you, Chair, and I'll be really brief. Thank you, Director Alicon, for bringing us to the 21st century when it comes to smart parking. My question is related to the user mechanism of it. Uh, having parked in private parking and been mistakenly charged for not mistakenly ticketed when I did actual, actually pay, fortunately, there was a process for me to appeal the ticket and to send them a copy of my receipt where they then took off the charge. Is that available with this particular uh, program that we have? And if not, is that something we can put in place where there's an appeals process or some kind of confirmation process? Because unfortunately, technology is not perfect. <laughs> no, it's not. Um, thank you for that. Yes, we'll be actually working with the courts on how they want to handle the appeal process and what that will look and go through. So when we actually bring the the equipment in and we're actually going through what I call the uh, planning part of it to the production. It's all going to be built into that. The courts are going to be right there with us on what that process is going to look and we'll be making sure we're communicating that very much with the public as well. So that's part of a, a full-blown marketing campaign that we're looking to work with LAS on and what that would look like to the community. Thank you. Councilmember O'Connell. Thank you. I'm just uh, at this point, having looked at the answers and looked at the fact sheet we got, I just need to make sure I'm understanding the uh, the differences in check marks because this does not say um, that the 2021 agreement would cover uh, residential. So it, the residential, I'm, you're right, I didn't put it in here, but that's part of our enforce, enforcement. We do that today. We just do not do it well. And so with this plan or with this contract that we will be adding additional folks that will allow us to actually be out there enforcing. So part of our current parking program that we have today includes residential parking permitting and we will be continue to do that under, uh, under the same program, but LAS will be adding additional staff to help us actually do better enforcement throughout the city. So I guess I'm just looking for accuracy because I would not want to send this out to my constituents with it saying vendor will manage residential parking valet zones and loading zones with a check by 2019, but a not check by 2021. And it turns out that's not actually true. So I'm sorry. Yes, ma'am. I see you. Council. <laughs> Well, I, you were perhaps about to make the point of clarification. I think, you know, from a, the smart parking piece of it, um, as far as current Metro staff versus what LAZ is adding more specifically in the areas that were metered, we intend to be metered in our commercial spaces, mm -hmm. whereas uh, our current uh, Metro employees and the team as organized will then have more time and space to enforce 
bike lanes, residential permit, as currently already codified, but we don't um, enforce it sufficiently because our small cohort is spread over the entire system to include the meters that will um, be switched over to a more. So we're not kind of bringing smart parking Flowbird kiosks into neighborhoods, right? right? So I think that's kind of the distinction we're trying to make here. It's all under the umbrella of an enhanced parking program. The smart aspect is more in our commercial areas to what Councilor Allen was speaking to because that optimizes and is pro-business, right? Um, having turnover rather than somebody coming, parking a meter all day long, mm -hmm. not paying for it, that doesn't help business. So um, it's, it's um, it, yeah, so we're, we're not, Councilman O'Connell, um, uh, and your point is well made about potential confusion. We're not gonna drop Floberg kiosks into neighborhoods and, and start charging in that regard in this program. So Director Alarcon, I apologize. I'm no, no, you thank respond. you so much for that clarification. And if I can just add on the back sheet, this was the difference in solicitation. So when the RFP went out in 2019, LAS was gonna be managing, or the contractor, which at that time it was LAS, would have been managing all of that. When we put out the solicitation in 2021, all of that management and everything stayed on Metro. We're just adding staff so we can be more efficient in the enforcement side of it. So that's why you see a non-check mark. So all of that is actually staying under the guidance, the management, the responsibility of Metro, but we are using LAS as additional staff to help us enforce it, sir. Okay, I mean, I will just say as somebody who has a number of residential permit uh, parking zones, I, I would feel a lot better with folks knowing up front uh, before we approved this, that that was a potential change rather than waiting to tell them until after. Um, so I'll, I'll state it that way. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member O'Connell. Is any other discussion on the bills amended? Council Member Henderson, do you need the floor? I would just renew my motion for approval as amended, please. Thank you, Council Member. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Any opposed? Uh, it is recommended for approval. We have uh, two other items. I've got one uh, bill to get through and then uh, NDOT has another presentation they wanna give before we conclude. The bill is BL 2022-1470, amend section 13.08.080 of the Metro Code to authorize the use of data collection and video technologies solely for the purpose of traffic monitoring and management by the Metro Department of Information Technology Services in the Nashville Department of Transportation and Multimodal Infrastructure. Uh, do I have a motion for approval? Moving property seconded. Any discussion on that bill? Seeing none, all in favor? Any opposed? Bill is recommended for approval. Now we'll turn this back over to our NDOT officials for another presentation. go fast. So thank you, uh, good evening. Thank you for the opportunity to come and present about this. This is something that we have worked with uh, Metro ITS for quite some time with on and it. And I'm gonna have Derek Haggerty provide you a presentation, providing you an overview of it. It really c is coming into play more and more when we look to our traffic management center, actually that we were awarded a grant uh, last year of $3.9 million to actually deploy our traffic management center. But Derek is gonna give you an overview of what this bill is about. Once we get that, yeah, if I can get this working. Once we get the screen up, you might have to open your open your. There you go. Yep. I think we're getting it up there, though. to zoom in and go from that. Every time we go to the presentation mode, up link it kicks it out there. So we'll have to zoom in and do that. If you can get the zoom over here on there. Can everyone see that? Yes. All right. 
All right, you're on, right. Like Brad mentioned, my name is Derek Hagerty with NDOT, also a council district 25 resident. Uh, not looking for favorable treatment though, unless it's softball questions, but talking about bill 2022-1470 today, which is on second reading tonight. Uh, bill highlights just really quick, this would authorize the use of data collection video technology solely for the purpose of traffic monitoring and management by Metro ITS and NDOT. A uh, few bullets there on what this will not do, essentially not gonna collect any, person, any personal identification identifiable information. It's gonna be a live stream. We're not gonna save anything, not gonna be able to pause it. And it's not gonna be used by law enforcement. So really quick, why do we need traffic management cameras? That's really what this comes down to. And it's to support our traffic management center. As I think you all know, we were awarded a grant last year to build out a traffic management center. And just to update that, we've just received approval on the NEPA phase, the environmental clearance. So now we're moving forward with the systems engineering analysis before we're issued our NTP from TDOT for implementation. Uh, we expect to have that funding made available in February. And by the time we work through procurement, are able to order everything. We're open to have a light launch this summer and probably full operations a little after that. But these cameras are really essential to that traffic management center. If we're gonna actively manage traffic, we have to know what's going on out on our transportation network. So few areas this comes into effect, safety incident management. If there is a vehicle crash, we wanna be able to get eyes on, manage, that response from one center and also help route other traffic around that spot. Special events, big one in Nashville. Currently, if there's a special event at Bridgestone or Nissan Stadium, MNPD officers are manually operating over 30 signals. That's really not what MNPD has to be doing, especially not in 2022. So with cameras out there, we can help see the pedestrian flow, run those signals from a centralized location with much fewer staff. Uh, also maintenance, this is a big one. You know, we have a really hard working maintenance staff. They get calls all the time that, hey, a signal's not working. Well, that can mean a lot of different things. So the ability to have a camera, be able to look at the signal function, see what's going on, can save our maintenance technicians, I mean, hundreds, thousands of man hours throughout the year. And finally, just day-to-day -day congestion. Uh, in the past, Nashville and most cities, probably until about 2000, looked to update their signal timings every three to five years. You know, with the city growing as fast as Nashville, that's just, it's not efficient, it's also not safe. So being able to monitor these day-to-day -day conditions, update our signal timings in real time, and be able to review the impacts that has will just increase uh, safety and efficiency, I mean, multiple times throughout our network. So, essential there. Um, so that's kind of why we're looking for the cameras. The reason we're bringing this ordinance here, there's, there's a few different things. One, really want to differentiate between traffic management and surveillance. We have no intention and no interest in reading license plates, in seeing individual faces, and in, you know, taking fingerprints, anything like that. We just wanna see the shape of cars, the shape of pedestrians, bicycles. That's the level of quality we're looking for. And we just wanna make sure that is very clear to not only our elected officials, but the public as a whole. When these cameras go up, you know, we wanna at least have a video recording of why we're doing this, the purpose behind them. Uh, additionally, we do wanna be transparent if you you know, read the code section that we're looking to amend here. There is language how, you know, a surveillance device is not considered a surveillance device. If you're not saving data, if it's being deleted immediately, which this would be with the live stream. But, we, you know, similar to everything you've been hearing from Brad and Diana these last few months, wanna be really transparent with what we're doing here. And finally, video quality. Um, took a snapshot here off the TDOT SmartWays cameras, so you can kind of get a look at the video quality. Um, we're gonna be using two megapixel cameras, and just to put that in perspective, my Metro-issued phone is an iPhone 6. That has an eight megapixel camera. If you get a new iPhone, I think it's the 14 now, that's a 48 megapixel camera. So these two megapixel cameras, Great for what we're doing. You know, you can see the level of detail there. You're not reading license plates. You're not seeing faces. Saves us some money. We're not looking for that level of clarity.
And finally, alignment with existing plans, uh, Metro Nashville transportation plan calls for the installation of 50 cameras a year. This would obviously tie in with that. Nashville's Vision Zero Action Plan, Implementation Plan, there's a lot in there about near miss data, being able to collect that, pedestrian, bicyclist counts. Currently, cameras and LIDAR to a certain degree are the best technologies available for that. We're currently working with the University of Tennessee Chattanooga, Tennessee State University and Vanderbilt University on a grant application to help bring some of that technology in in an anonymized format. So. I think that grant is due November 18th, you'll see a little more, but pretty exciting to be able to collect that data and really have you know, granular safety data that we can then work to implement quickly. Um, finally, Metro Nashville ITS implementation plan called for a uh, little over 200 cameras being installed on our major arterials by 2026. Uh, the overall network had estimated that we would need 640 cameras to cover the entire extent. So this ordinance would help clear the way for that effort. And then finally, I just want to pull up an example here. This is the city of Murfreesboro. They have a live YouTube feed, so you can really see what this looks like at a city level. Uh, this is a little choppier than what we would be seeing in the TMC just because it's being broadcast on YouTube, but you have a pretty good idea of the level of detail, the clarity that you'd be seeing. All right, that's our presentation. Do you have any? Chair, do you have, want to, I don't know if we have much time for questions, but. Um, we'll what, was that the last finally? I know I heard four of them, so uh, <laughs> <laughs> anyway. <laughs> um, this, I didn't quite realize what this presentation was about or we would have done it before the last bill that we passed regarding this. So unless anyone wants to rescind the action the committee take has taken, we'll uh, entertain questions you have on this. So Councilmember Allen. So will y'all be using this to like tweak signalization timing and things like that and and maybe like when it's okay for lights to blink until six o'clock in the morning yes because right now they're still staying red at three in the morning and there's nobody there we all be i mean is, is it feeding into that we will have butts in the seats monitoring our system and this is what we'll be looking for to how we optimize our traffic signal system in addition to that event management is going to be key right. in the future you know we have a lot of major events here in Nashville. So this is actually gonna help facilitate that event management. Thank you, Councilmember Allen. Any other questions? Seeing none. All right, this will conclude our meeting for the day. Thank you all for attendance. The meeting's adjourned.